morning, everybody. A bit awkward, as I said to um, those at Risley this morning at the service there. It's very awkward to get these things on and off and got hearing aids, spectacles, and hair that hasn't seen scissors for at <laughs> least three months. Good yeah, morning to all in church this morning and, and also in your own homes. And thank you to Charlotte for reading all that scripture. When I first saw it, I gulped, really. But um, yeah, we'll get there, I think. But I hope you've got a couple of hours to spare this morning. Is that okay? Last Sunday, we remembered that God had done an amazing thing. Jesus had risen from the dead. Today is traditionally called Low Sunday, and it was called that even before the death of Prince Philip. But it's surely some mistake, because Jesus is still risen. It's just one short week. We can't have forgotten so soon. As we continue through the book of Exodus, we discover that it certainly seems that the Israelites had a short memory. God had freed them from slavery. He'd opened up the Red Sea to allow them to pass through and drowned all their following enemies. Then they grumbled because they were hungry. So God provided quail and what's it? That's what the Hebrew word manna means. What is it? Then they got upset because they were thirsty. So God did a quick plumbing job and they drank water from a rock. Moses cried out to God in frustration. What am I to do with these people? And it's recorded in Exodus chapter 17 verse 7 that the Israelites questioned, Is the Lord among us or not? They were about to find out yet again that he was. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the story of the salvation of your people recorded here for us in the book of Exodus. A story which mirrors our story of salvation in Jesus in so many ways. Help us today as we delve into those truths. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Who were these people? Well, if you checked out their DNA, they were descended from Amalek who was one of Esau's grandsons, Jacob's brother. Remember Esau, the one who was so miffed that he'd lost his birthright and his blessing, that he married two Canaanite wives against his father Isaac's wishes. Therefore you could say that these people were born in rebellion. Now remember that the Israelites were ex-slaves, shepherds and brickmakers who had never fought a battle in their lives. Moses told Joshua to select men for his army and told him that in the morning he would stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in his hands. What follows is so well known. When Moses held up his hands, the Israelites prevailed. When he lowered them, the Amalekites prevailed. When he got exhausted, his two companions got him a stone to sit on and held up his hands until sunset. It was a long day. Joshua and his army overcame the Amalekites with the sword. Now I suspect that if you, if you had a big, hairy Amalekite bearing down on you with a sword, that you wouldn't have time to look up and see Moses, if he had his arms raised or not. But you would have been told beforehand that he was there. And he had the staff of God in his hands, which was just an ordinary piece of wood. But it was a symbol of God's power. It had been used to turn the Nile into blood and bring water from a rock. Just a week last Friday, we remembered somebody else who climbed a hill with an ordinary lump of wood. He had been helped by Simon of Cyrene to carry it when he was exhausted. It became for us the symbol of our salvation and what happened there and with what followed a symbol of God's power. After the battle, the Lord said to Moses, write all this down on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it. 
because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek from the heaven. Joshua was going to do a lot of battling before he'd finished and he needed to know and remember that God was with him. The first battle against the Amalekites was over. However, the war was not done. King Saul, followed by King David, fought with them constantly. And even in the book of Esther, we find Haman, who was descended from the Amalekites, intending to wipe out the Jewish nation. Then, a young Jewish girl by the name of Esther and her uncle Mordecai were used by God so that Haman literally got his comeuppance on his own scaffold. You see, there had to be a Jewish nation because the scripture that his God had said that Messiah would come through them. When people today follow Christ, they are sometimes surprised that we have an enemy who wants to discourage the Christian believer. The New Testament is full of words like the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for who he can devour and put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Don't worry though, because the one who is in you, that's Jesus, is greater than the one who is in the world. Moses built an altar, or memorial, and called it, The Lord is my banner. Armies even use banners today. And back in World War II, you've probably seen the iconic picture of six soldiers raising the American flag on the highest point of Iwo Jima. And you, before lockdown, you've probably seen this too at many football grounds. And I do apologise to those who have a different persuasion, but you'd see oh, the no. crowd standing around doing this. <laughs> Nobody had lent me a forest uh, scarf, they didn't know what I was going to do with it. Seriously though, I do just use this to keep my neck warm. <laughs> but the banner that Moses would use would say Jehovah Nissi, or Yahweh Nissi. It means God is my banner. And like Moses, it's the one that we should raise. At a baptism service here in church, you may sometimes hear this prayer from the congregation. Fight valiantly under the banner of Christ against sin, the world and the devil and continue his faithful soldier and servant to the end of your life. Moving on to Exodus chapter 18, it says, Now Jethro, the priest of Midian and father-in-law of Moses, heard everything that God had done for Moses and for his people Israel and how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. How did you married men out there get on with your father-in-law for the first time? A work colleague of mine from Mansfield, on his first date, met his prospective father-in-law, who lived in Belper, who asked him, how did you get here? My friend replied, I came be car. He told me that dad-to-be looked quite surprised and kept having a nervous glance out of the window expecting to see a black and white Frisian cow tied up to the nearest lamppost. <laughs> I was a bit scared of my father-in-law at first. He had arms like tree trunks and his party trick was to crack walnuts in his bare hands. <laughs> we did become the best of friends though. Back in Exodus chapter 2 we found that Moses made a good impression on his future father-in-law before he was even introduced. In fact, when Jethro discovered that Moses had come to the aid of his daughters by chasing off some shepherds so that they could water their flocks, he couldn't wait to get him back and feed him and get him married off to one of his daughters called Zipporah. You might say to me, Ralph, that in Exodus 2, 2 chapter 2, it was called Rua. In Exodus chapter 3, it was called Jethro. Well, I researched this in a big way, great detail, looking at every resource I could find. And I even discovered that in the book of Numbers, it was called Hobab. My conclusion in all this was that in Exodus chapter 2, it was called Ruah. In Exodus chapter 3, it was called Jethro. And in the book of Numbers, it was called Hobab. If it really bothers you, 
when you find out, can you please let me know? Because I have <laughs> Back in chapter 18, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, together with Zipporah, Moses' wife, and two sons, Gershom, which means I've become a foreigner in a foreign land, and Eliza, which means God is my helper, went to visit Moses in the wilderness, where he was camped near the mountain of God. Incidentally, if you take a look at Prince Philip's coat of arms, it has the words on the bottom, God is my help. Evidently, Zipporah had gone back home for some reason when Moses went to Egypt. Moses showed due respect to Jethro when they met. He bowed down and greeted him with a kiss. Now it says in verse 1 that Jethro had heard all about that, what God had done to rescue the Israelites. Now, however, he hears all about how God had dealt with Pharaoh and the Egyptians from the very lips of Moses. About this time of year, we sometimes hear about two travellers on their way to Emmaus. How Jesus had met with them on the road and explained all the scriptures which referred to him. How they hadn't recognised him until he broke bread with them. Can you imagine for a moment when they'd rushed back to the disciples in Jerusalem, how their eyes must have glowed, and in their excitement, how breathless their voices would have been. Was it like that for Moses, as he recounted what God had done? Did it encourage him to tell someone else, his father-in-law no less, a Midianite priest? Notice the difference now. When Moses had first said to Jethro, back in Exodus chapter 4, about going back to Egypt, it was to see if his family were still alive. No mention about his meeting with God in the burning bush. Now he just can't stop, even about the hardships they had along the way. What has God been doing in your lives recently? It might be worth chatting about it, because just look at Jethro's response in verse 9. He was delighted the old authorised version said, he rejoiced to hear about the good things that the Lord had done for Israel in rescuing them from the Egyptians. He said, praise be to the Lord who rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians and Pharaoh and who rescued the people from the hands of the Egyptians. He really got the message. He said, now I know that the Lord is greater than all other gods because he did this to those who had treated Israel arrogantly. What did he mean? Well, every one of those ten plagues that God had sent upon Egypt went against a pseudo-Egyptian deity. From the god of the Nile, which was turned into blood, to the death of the firstborn, even of Pharaoh, who in his arrogance had said, Who is the Lord? I don't know him. I will not let Israel go. Then Jethro did what the people of Israel should have been doing, Instead of grumbling, he offered sacrifices to God, which showed his change of heart. The next day, Moses went about his day job of sorting out disputes between the people from morning till evening. They must have stood there in long queues, just like the Antiques Roadshow. Jethro observed all this and gave Moses some advice, with a caveat of Moses checking it out with God first. He could see that Moses was simply wearing himself out. That was perhaps why Moses had cried out to the Lord previously, what am I to do with these people who are so tired? Have you experienced that feeling when you've been really busy all day and in your tiredness shouted out in frustration at something you would normally have just dealt with easily? Jethro said it was right that Moses should be God's representative and teach the people God's laws and how to live. But he needed to divide the men up into judges over 1,100s and 50s and 10s, and only deal with the difficult cases himself. Just think what amazing principle that is. Before Jesus ascended back to heaven, he left, left just a small ragtag group of men with instructions to go into all the world and spread the good news of the gospel. On that day of Pentecost, the same group filled with the Holy Spirit began to do just that. And guess what? Even you and I have heard it. 
here in Stanton by Dale. Then in verse 27, Moses sent his father-in-law back home. We don't know if Jethro, as a new convert, wanted to stay with God's people, but Moses sent him home. Can you remember the account of the demon-possessed man in the region of Gerasenes, whom Jesus set free? He wanted to follow Jesus, but Jesus sent him home to tell people how much he'd done for him. And I'm sure that Jethro would have had a lot to say about what he'd seen and heard. But what we heard only just a week ago, haven't we got a lot to tell ourselves? Just what God has done for us. Finally, the story of Exodus is beginning to change. Chapters 1 to 18 are about the great escape. From chapter 19 onwards, it's how the Israelites should uh, behave and live their lives. It was just two months since they left Egypt. And they're now camped in the shadow of Mount Sinai. Mo Moses meets with God on the mountain and is given some words to deliver to the Israelites. Notice he uses the phrase at first, the descendants of Jacob, to remind them that they were to be the nation that inherited Abraham, Isaac and Jacob's promise. They've seen with their own eyes what he did to in Egypt and how he looked after them. Now, if... If they obeyed him fully, kept his covenant, then they would be his treasured possession, a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. The story continues next week. But we too have that promise. So let us press on towards the goal which God has called us heavenward in Christ Jesus. Because Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.